Hi, this is Kevin Booth, two-time Super Bowl champion of the New York Football Giants. This is the NFL Players Second Acts podcast. <laughs> Nailed it! Call, there's, a, there's a nail. Call Ooh. me, call me Bobby De Niro. Man. Oh, hey. One take, Bobby. Hey, give me some. That it. was legit. One take, that Bobby. Was, hey, you're right. One take, Bobby. <laughs> Peanut Tillman, and this is the NFL Player Second Acts Podcast. I got my 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 co-host with me. He a little mad at me right now. This is my guy, Roman. I'm always never on time, Harper. What's up, baby? I'm doing good. How are you guys doing? Let's put up this wall right here. <laughs> Hopefully, we can tear it down at some point in between the start and the finish of this next great interview that we're going to have with our guests today. But before I get there, let me first and foremost tell our viewers and everybody out there watching us as well, make sure you can definitely give us a five-star rating. Continue to uh, hit that like button. Give us a five-star rating, like I just said. I don't know why I'm just repeating myself. Peanut got me all in my feels over here. And, and after that, wherever you listen to your podcast, whether it's Apple Podcasts, iHeartRadio, continue to tell a friend to tell a friend to tell a friend. Come check us out. Continue to check us out. Pino, who we got today? We got a good guest, y'all. Let me read his resume real quick. He was a six-round draft. What is about these 2006 draft class, We guys? in here. Y'all we in are here. game so, changers. Yeah, we so. are delivering. We are great. We are the future. Y'all need to be quiet. So okay. he's a 2006 <laughs> uh, draft pick. Uh out of Cornell, Ivy League school, so y'all know he got the big brain on him. Uh, he's an offensive lineman, played 10 he years. He don't look like it. <laughs> not now, <laughs> but he, not. he played 10 years in the NFL, won two Super Bowl with your Giants of New York City, and now he's working at the league office over player personnel. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the show, Mr. Kevin Booth. Hey, happy to be here. That's so funny, though, because um, you made me think of coming to America. The Giants of New York. The Bacchus of Green. Yeah, that's, that was what I said. I, I was looking at coming to America. The, Giants. the Giants of New York. It was the most interesting <laughs> thing. <laughs> Oblong. <laughs> yeah. so, so, Kevin, man, I, I just got to know, um, off the top, whenever I hear of any small college guy mm -hmm. getting drafted to the NFL, automatically I'm like, they probably just destroyed people. Dominated. Just destroyed <laughs> Dominated. People. Was that the case with you? Were you just destroying cats in college? Uh, you were a three-time All-American at, at, uh, Cornell. at Cornell. So, I got you. Um, thank you. I almost said Columbia, but because we're in New oh, York. Man. You see, can see, see that's, that's, that's fighting fight words. words right? Do yeah, not yeah, do that. Like, yeah, no, no, no. That's like me like, calling you a cap. You'd be like, hey, oh, chill out here now. We go. See? Here chill we out. Go. Got personal quick. Here we go. College was fun. College yeah. was fun. Um, I like to joke around with some of my old teammates. I let them know that I peaked in college because that was, it, you know, it was fun to have other coaches scared of an offensive lineman. You know, they weren't necessarily scared of our skill position players, which, you know, it's probably a different story. But uh, it was definitely a fun time. And I figured if you're good enough in college, you'll get an opportunity. So yeah, I wasn't necessarily sure. focused on, uh, you know, how I could get to the NFL through a bigger school. It was more of if I dominate like I should, I'll get a chance to show what I could do at the next level. So did you like take anybody over to the water cooler? Like I've seen highlights of like, oh, yeah, were you just, like the just, blind side? Yeah. yeah. Were you like that dominant? Yeah. In some ways. Well, I'll tell you this. My sophomore year, I actually broke both my hands four weeks apart. So I missed one slapping? game. <laughs> but basically, Man, who was you slapping? <laughs> for, the, for the second half of the season, I basically had two clubs on my hand. Uh -huh. And, uh, they, that's what a lot of. So you had two weapons. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> okay, <laughs> pretty much. And I would dare the officials to throw a flag. And I think I got a couple that season. But uh, boy, yeah, them Q-tips ready. Out, right? and, and Cornell's <laughs> also known there. They like to have a good time on that campus as well. Yeah, for an Ivy League school, I think a lot of people don't realize it's actually a bigger school than you would think. So a lot of students, other Ivy League say? schools, it's I want to say about twelve to thirteen thousand undergrad. So okay. um, that's, that's a decent that. size. Whereas you got some of the other Ivy League schools are only. Four or five thousand. So really, so we have a decent sized population there. Okay. Yeah. So what did you study at Cornell? Uh, hotel administration. So um, you go it, to Ivy League school. See, this is this takes me <laughs> to, to my study. welcome to the NFL <laughs> moment. Like, <laughs> <laughs> it's world renowned. It's it's very famous. And if you look up some of the alums uh, through Cornell's hotel school, uh, it's, it's, it's they have a hotel famous. school. They it's world famous. We have a hotel on campus, and essentially, it's a business degree with some hospitality mixed in. Now, it's uh, not all 
hotels. It could be uh, some of my peers have gone on to go into real estate yeah. and uh, other areas. Actually, one of my classmates is a co-founder of Lyft. So mm. uh, at Cornell. So okay. We have a sort of just drop that. We should have the yeah, right. Do right. <laughs> they yeah. take right tests? There. Like, what, what is the test? Well, well it's, you know, I took financial accounting. I okay. took, you know, I, I took you. a lot of There's business schools, business. but yeah, then yeah. there were okay. some hospitality you. geared uh, classes, you know. Yeah. Um, it's funny you mentioned that. That same reaction you had yeah. was uh, my rookie year in <laughs> Oakland. I, I was teammates with Warren Sapp. Mm -hmm. Warren Sapp stood up in the locker room and announced to the whole locker room, that this guy went to an Ivy League school <laughs> to run Holiday Inns. So, um, you know, and I had to explain that it's a famous school. And, you know, while Holiday Inns could be a part of my portfolio one day, uh, you know, is a little bit more to the degree. Yeah, that. I think that's, that's awesome. Hilarious. Yeah, I, I'm sure. I Because that's the first thing I'm like, hold on. What? So would you say that was your welcome to the NFL moment? It was when Warren Sapp did that when you uh, were in uh, Oakland? Yeah, I think so. Because it's those guys that, you know, you, I grew up watching. And, yeah. and you yeah. know, that was one of my first interactions with them. So it's uh, all right. Yeah. What was it like in Oakland playing back then? Uh, I don't Al Davis was still alive yes. at the time. Yep. So, uh, yeah, Mr. Davis was around. Willie so. Brown. And did you ever Willie get used Brown. to having the, 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 like the, the, the dirt at the home field? Oh, yeah. that was, that's really that's unique. Terrible. It was, was so, for, I hated for people it. that weren't used to uh -huh. it, we come out there and we just hated it. And the worst thing about it is that one season, my rookie year when I was out there, the A's were actually pretty good. So, uh, so the season went longer. So yeah, we didn't we didn't get <laughs> the grass true. until you know halfway through the season because they made it all the way to like the ALCS or something oh, like that. So okay. man, that for a lineman, you didn't want to hit the ground. Yeah, but uh, going against defensive linemen, it actually helped us because Slowed they couldn't get they couldn't get off the ball because <laughs> yeah. they couldn't dig in and and fire off. So you know everybody kind of protected each other around the. I tried my hardest not to go down when right we, when we had to play there in the dirt. I was just like, <laughs> I am not trying to make this tackle. Let me just try to sling them. <laughs> and just, I just tried to what, helicopter him. It, it was, it was the man, worst. So I only played out there once, but mm -hmm. it was so annoying. Twice and it's immediately, me. you're like, it's a big difference. It is. It's it a is. huge difference. And it's, it's, it's yeah. nobody wants to go in that area. The whole <laughs> offense kind of changes. <laughs> right. Nobody wants to be in it. It's like, ah, I mean, we don't, don't do everything the Stop running to the ball. Yeah, yeah. It's like, like, uh, uh, no, I, I, yeah, Rome will get the tackle. He's going to make that up. <laughs> I think I'm supposed to cut the backside on this one. Yeah. Ah, I can get there. Yeah. Yeah. I, don't need to, I don't need to get that. So out of the two Super Bowls that you won, right, yeah. which one was more memorable? Uh, for me personally, um, it was the second one. So it's fun to say, oh, the second one meant more to me. <laughs> um, I might be the only one on my team to say that who have two Super Bowl rings. And the reason why is because the first one, um, it was my second year in the league. Yeah. I started – most of my rookie year as a six-round draft choice with the Oakland Raiders. But mm -hmm. as you know, football is a business. Yeah. We had a new coach. We weren't very good. I was released, picked up by the Giants, and essentially had a redo of my rookie year. So yeah. mm. I looked at it as my first year was on-field rookie year. My second year, I go to the Giants that has a, one of the best offensive lines in recent memory. And essentially, they taught me what it was like to be a pro off the field. So, mm. you know, everything from football prep with film, uh, weightlifting, how to manage my time, how to, how to just become a complete football player. So uh, that second year, I didn't play a lot. So I didn't, I was actually a healthy and active for most of that year and then just played field goal and the old uh, wedge back in those days on oh, kickoff yeah. return, which the old was swing, the a swing nightmare, old lineman. a nightmare, <laughs> nightmare, <laughs> you know? And then, uh, but for the second one, I was a starter for the second half of that season. So. What I want to know is how how crazy was it when you uh, when you see Eli Manning of uh, Super Bowl forty two you see Eli Manning scrambling on that play he's about to get sacked uh -huh. he doesn't get sacked he's up there you're on the field actually blocking not, not on that one so Super Bowl forty two I was actually on the sideline so I actually had a great view of it uh, I remember if I remember correctly it was third down and five yeah one sixteen to go everybody on their feet Tyree split right Manning takes the snap. Back to throw, under pressure, avoids the rush, and he's going to fight out of it, still fights out of it, now throws it deep downfield, wide open Tyree, who makes the catch! At the 23-yard line, what a play by Manning! He's eluded three sacks, he runs up to Mike Carey and calls a timeout, and what a catch by Tyree with 58 seconds to go! Tyree had Harrison all over him, the ball was on his helmet, but he got his other hand on it and pulled it in. That's some play. And, you know, we battled with this team toe-to-toe. -to -toe. 
And then when I saw him get grabbed immediately, and it's one of the running jokes we have with the offensive line group is whose fault was it really? It's uh-huh. either the center, Sean O'Hara, or the left guard, Rich Soybert. One of those two uh, gave up penetration to Richard Seymour very quickly. But when I saw Eli get I'm grabbed. I'm surprised they didn't blow the whistle. Me too. Thing. I thought, that's, I was like, we came all this way and we lost the Super Bowl. You know, it was like, man, this stinks, man. You almost wish you just got blown out at this point if you got this close. And then you see him escape and you're like, oh, man, we got it. <laughs> And then when he threw it, I was like, oh, we lost again. Because I was like, 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 it was like rule up number and down, one, up and down. Rule number one is don't field. scramble and just throw the ball up high in the middle of the field. Yeah, right? right. Clean away, just threw it up in the middle of the field. Here's this grenade. Yeah. I remember, I think Mario Manningham made a great catch on the sidelines, too. Super Bowl 46. So that was, oh, that was, so I was on the field for that. I feel like I get him confused. Yeah, I'm so yeah. confused. They're very similar games. It's, yeah. it's eerie. Yeah. Yeah. It's eerie just the way the games went. Four-man rush. Eli throwing into traffic on the sideline. They're going to rule it a catch by Manningham. Now, Super Bowl 46, I was on the field, and uh, I'll never forget the pass protection because I was a left guard at the time, and it's this protection called 80 key, which is a six-man protection, our tight end staying in, and the tight end's on my side, and the rule that week was, hey, left tackle Dave Deal, you go help the tight end leave Booth alone. And I'm looking at Vince Wilfork here, uh, one on one. And if I tell you, if you go back and watch that one, if Eli has to hitch one more second, I think I'm on top of Eli. I mean, I'm holding on for dear life with uh, Vince, Vince Wilfork. And uh, luckily, Eli got the ball out to Mario on that play. Yeah. So, okay. Tim, I, I had like a very chilled coach in Lovey Smith, like uh-huh. super calm, very laid back. What was it like playing for Tom Coughlin? Coach Coffin, that's still to this day uh, one of my very good friends and somebody who I look up to. Yeah. He is no nonsense, as you would expect. <laughs> yeah. The thing, very old the, school. The thing that I really appreciate about him mm-hmm. is that it is black and white. There is no gray area. You know exactly where you stand, mm-hmm. and there's always room for improvement. So, no matter if you've played a great game or a poor game, there's always something to critique. So, yeah. you know, there's times where you come off a big win and you're thinking everything's great. And you walk by him, hey, coach, how we doing? He's like, are we going to block the three? The three, the three, the three, the three? <laughs> what are we doing? What are we doing? Come on. You know? Uh, so, you know, he always kept you on your toes. But he's one of those guys that he had his set, set of rules. Yeah. And if you followed him and you competed, you were his guy. Yeah. And he'd do anything for you. So That's cool. And I think that that culture kind of went through that those Giants teams where we weren't necessarily the best, you know, record wise, but it would always show up every Sunday. We were always prepared to play and knew what we had to do. So. Yeah. Not only that, but playoff Eli was was pretty good, too. Yeah. And um, uh, how has that really have maybe impacted your life going forward? I look at myself and most football guys, especially ones that are able to play and have any type of success in the league. Mm hmm. You're a plus minus guy. Like mm-hmm. at the heart of hearts, like I just want to be graded. Like I'm very cool with yeah. being critiqued. Yeah. Uh so having a coach like Tom Coughlin, what does his impact not only do for you as a player, but then really now and your in your second chapter, yeah. uh being able to be open, being ready to be graded, I guess, of some sorts, always told for it what you need to do it to improve. You brought up a great point. And I think the one thing that we as football players often uh sell ourselves short on is the skills that we strengthen while we're playing. So, you know, the ones that stand out for me are, uh, you know, that ability to perform, Mm -hmm. right? Being at your best when your best is needed, being resilient because football, (laughs) every play is not going to be great. Right. There's going to be some very bad plays mixed in with some good plays and some okay plays, you know? Um, But then also just being coachable and, and being eager to be coached, being Mm -hmm. eager to be corrected, wanting to be corrected. Yeah. And that's something that especially, my time with Coach Coughlin, you know, we joked about always having something to nitpick on. Yeah. I think that that's the type of stuff that really helped me moving forward because it's, you know, yes, I can, you know, work on this project or this assignment and everything's great, but there's always room to improve. Yeah. And I don't take it personally when somebody, you know, critiques it or ha- offers suggestions. And I think that's something that uh, we often take for granted as athletes. But that's what, I, 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 for the most part, though, we, you know, we've had a couple other guests on the show. Mm-hmm. Like a lot of guests that we've had on the show, they're in media now. And one of the things when they, the football players, when they get into the media, they don't get critiqued. You know, and we're so used to going out there, you do something, you look at the film. Right. And your coaches, plus or minus. Right. This is good. This is bad. Right. And so often when you in that the in when you're in the role of a, a, a broadcaster or an analyst, your your person or whoever your producer is, they just kinda like, uh, 
That was great. Yeah. Good job. Good job. Good, good right? job. Yeah. That was great. But I don't. I, we we don't we don't operate in that space. Right, like no. we have to. We run toward the criticism. We mm-hmm. want to be told. I yearn for it. Right. Plus or minus. Because you're always you're improve. always yeah. wanting to improve. Right. So that's the that's the the one great thing I love about us as athletes. Right, like exactly. we're always looking for that improvement. So you got drafted by the Saints, played in Carolina, then went back to the Saints. Mm-hmm. Full circle moment, right? You yourself drafted by the Raiders for a year. Come up to uh, uh, New England, not New England, excuse me, New York for about what eight years, yeah, and then you go, yeah. back go back to yeah. Oakland for another year. Yeah, how how crazy was that? How was that? It it was crazy. Yeah, you see that? You like that? You, see that. you like uh, that? You good. know, it, it it's a it's a bit surreal even looking back on it. How you're able to kind of have that bookend career? Yeah. Um, it's interesting because those those two <laughs> those two Raider stints on the field weren't great right. from a record standpoint, but I. I think I really appreciated my journey because when I came back as a an old grizzled veteran, uh, you know, I think that was that was Derek Carr's rookie year. Khalil Mack's rookie year was my last year in the league. You know, you realize and appreciated how how far you've come and how much you've learned and you try to pass on some of that knowledge and some of those experiences so that you can help out that younger group. And uh, so it was, a, it was a great experience. I purposely went back to my old number so that my family didn't have to get new jerseys or so that I didn't have to get new jerseys. Uh, but you know how free agency is. Uh, it, it was tough. It was definitely tough to leave New York at the time uh, because of all the success that we'd had. Yeah. But, you know, the way things go and free agency and yeah. team needs and what the team team's roster looks like, sometimes you don't have a choice. So uh, it was a little bit bittersweet, but you know, it, it was one of those things that I was happy to be able to go back to a place that I was familiar with. Some yeah. of the staff there was still in place and uh, ultimately end my career. So it, it looks pretty, at least on the so outside. So were you like the Warren Sapp when you went back? Were you were you hazing rookies? Were you making fun of people with their degrees and what they were doing there? <laughs> no, no, no. I learned my lesson. Uh, you know, it, it, one of the funny things in the locker room, you guys probably appreciated this because you had people like this and Peanut, unfortunately, Louisiana might have fallen into this bucket, but when you get to those Saturday walkthroughs and all yeah. the trash talking starts to take place oh, because, days, yeah. you know, the Thousands, Saturday, yeah. you know, the SEC games and yeah. all that stuff. Yeah. Luckily for most of my career with the Giants, I had a, a teammate of mine, Zach Diossi, who went to Brown and I played against him in college. Okay. And we'd have our one Saturday, you know, a year where we could open up our mouths and everybody's looking Talk at us. Laughing, you know, uh, they're like, oh, this is cute. You know, the two Ivy Leaguers are going to, you know, did you guys even start playing football yet? Because the season would start so late. Uh, yeah. So, you know, I'd always keep my mouth shut around guys, especially those that came from the big schools. That's hilarious. I did, you're right, though. The yeah. Ivy League's like, oh, oh you guys do y'all got yeah. 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 okay. It's not okay. a club sport. No, no, no. We play. All right, Kevin, you got to tell me this. So how much did you weigh when you played? So I played most of my career anyway, anywhere from about 305 to 315. All right. And there. how much are you weighing right now? Uh, on a good day, probably around 245. So I hover around that 245 to 250 range. All right. So, now, how how has this weight loss journey been for you? Because we all know it. Yeah. Most, most old linemen, mm-hmm. they go either or. Right. right? They yeah. either pack it on uh-huh. and pack out or... <laughs> Or they lose it all. all right. And um, you're on the opposite end of it. You look like a tight end. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, you know, for me, it was just a matter of staying into a routine. So, you know, once the playing career ended and I knew it was winding down, I knew it was important to prepare myself for the next phase of life, you know, whatever it would be. Uh, and in you the didn't know office. at the time. Didn't know. You know, I kind of knew that I wanted to stay involved with football, mm-hmm. but um, needed to keep myself busy. I didn't yeah. want to just sit there and, um, you know, pout about not playing football or watch TV and think that I could still do it, uh, even though I probably did go through that phase, if you ask my wife, for a little bit at least. Um, so it was just a matter of staying in routine. So I knew that I was typically get up in the morning, go to the facility and work out prior to meetings and all that stuff. So I just kind of kept that routine. And it's something that I've kept today. So I uh, wake up every morning and now it's become such a habit where if I don't do it, I almost feel guilty or something's off for yeah. the rest of the day, yeah. you know? So uh, just staying into a routine and building good habits. And, uh, you know, it's been a fun journey. Not fun on the uh, the wallet because all those fine threads that you had to wear sure, to on the plane, <laughs> uh, you know, dress code with Coach Coughlin, you know, yeah. uh, suits for away games. A lot of those, it got to a point where my tailor is like, hey, there's nothing I can do about this, buddy. There's only so much, <laughs> I, I, there's only I, so I, much I, magic I, I can I, work. I can't take this in <laughs> right. anymore. Right? So exactly. the suits that you were wearing, did, I know the line used to have those, the, the walkers. Did you, do you remember you, the walkers? I do remember the walkers. The walkers. Were, a big thing. I did not, I did were you a walker guy? I had one walker that so was given to me for free, and then I never did again, and it went out. 
I felt like right after that phase. <laughs> yeah, I'm so glad I didn't get a walker. I'm so I, I know people that have whole closets. Yeah, still, still. Well, I don't know if they. But still they're only linemen. Only the only ones that they're had them. Comfortable. I never they were comfortable. They were I never, basically pajamas. I so. never saw a skilled person with a walker or a linebacker. There was all D line, O line. There's a reason. For the that. only reason you guys they, had they, walkers. They, they literally went out like right, right after, then. right it after, after like by oh eight, yeah. by oh eight. It was done. Yeah. So and you got in a year or two before us. So yeah, I was old. You were you were definitely like full blown Walker stage. Full blown, full blown Walker full blown. stage with the big I just guys. remember it's like these look like pajamas for, for fat people. <laughs> you have like, you have some, uh, threads, you know, fabrics on patterns. Yeah, you know, uh, it's, yeah. it's, it's, it's just crazy. checking the box. That's it. It's literally that's it. just what checking the box. Of, oh, I'm dressed up. I'm dressed up. <laughs> is this funny though? I won't get fined. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but that was a big. deal. It was like huh? linen. It was yeah, polyester. Yeah, cotton. That's a great question. That it, I people that don't know, you need to look this up. Google walking suit the walking suit NFL NFL, NFL office of lineman D line and walking suits you'll see a lot of large men wearing these pajamas hopefully I don't show up in it <laughs> yeah, oh my god you so, only had one that's good that's the only one and it was for free I didn't it was what uh, color like was a it? gift it was it was actually nice it was like a blackish gray and it kind of had a a pattern in it so it's one of those okay like a charcoal yeah, kind of you know exactly. like a gun metal kind of yes, yeah okay yes. I got you I got you so Dress up, dress down with it. Yeah, know, either way. So, so 2012, I <laughs> yeah. went back to school and I got my, uh, I got a master's degree. It mm-hmm. took me about three years, but I was still actively playing. So yeah. I was working. I was actually at the Pro Bowl when I started my first class. Mm-hmm. And I know you did the same thing. Similar. You got your, you got your MBA from George Washington. I know yes. the NFL. They have a uh, tuition assistance yeah. reimbursement type reimbursement. Type I don't know the exact name of mm-hmm. the the program, but you did that. Talk. I want you to tell us. Why you went back and was it a juggle for you to do it while you were still playing? Yeah. So I thought when I graduated from Cornell, I was like, man, that's it. I'm, done. I'm not going back <laughs> to school. That that was a lot harder than I thought it was going to be. Uh, you know, it's just one of those things that as you progress throughout your career and you start to realize that hey, this isn't going to last forever. Um, there was an opportunity at George Washington at the time to get my MBA while playing. Mm-hmm. So it was a, a very intense program of it took two years to do it. And uh, the way they did it is uh, we were in class for about six weeks each off season and then online work in between there. So there would actually be some online work in the season, even though they would try to scale it back a little bit, Mm -hmm. obviously, because we were tied up. But, um, you know, for those six weeks when we were in class, we were in, you you know, the, for the full day. And, and you're, mean, in, you're in uh, D.C. for these classes, so the, right? The great thing about it is it bounced around. So okay. we would do two weeks in D.C. We would do two weeks in New York City, which was very helpful. And then we actually did a summer two weeks out in L.A. Okay. So you got to move around a little awesome. bit and be on different college campuses in this program. And uh, it was a great experience. So it was a small cohort of, you know, some former players and other uh, people in the sports industry. And, you know, it was a it was something that I didn't anticipate doing, but I'm grateful that I did do it because I thought that just having that experience, being able to work through some of those, you know, case studies and things of that nature, those real life examples, it it felt more practical to me at that point than, you know, undergrad where you're taking the essential classes or the required classes. So I really enjoyed that experience. All right. So, uh, well, you and Peanut, both of you guys can answer this because I'm the only one that is not done extra uh, curriculars uh, as far as education is gone. Um, so has the, both you guys, has the degrees, have you guys used your degrees at all or is this like algebra for the rest of America? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I've used, I've used my degree in emergency management. Yeah. Okay. It's been, it's been fun. Yeah. Yeah. And I think my time in the league office, uh, you know, starting out in sponsorship and then now in my current roles, it's definitely helped. I think a lot of the organizational behavior work, you know, that HR, how to manage personalities, mm-hmm. how to work in groups and different roles, how to lead those types of uh, classwork and uh, case studies were essentially uh, vital for me. See, you hear that? Ladies and gentlemen, kids, family members alike, More algebra school. is for the benefit of all. And so <laughs> it does work and you might not understand and use it right now, but I knew that both of these gentlemen would say that, yes, we actually use our degrees. So, yes, yeah. that's really good. Yeah, yeah. you okay. do, you do. So, uh, when I was in Chicago, uh-huh. uh, Dwayne Joseph uh-huh. was my uh, player player development. Mm-hmm. He was my player development guy in Chicago. Mm-hmm. Now they call it player engagement. Player engagement. Yeah, now he's the assistant GM in the Las Vegas Raiders. Mm-hmm. And he had a, what a upgrade. Huge upgrade. He's worked <laughs> his butt off. Um, 
played a pivotal role in my career just with his leadership, mentorship, with what he taught me as a rookie. Mm -hmm. Now, talk, talk to the people um, about really what the role is of the player engagement person on the staff. Because yeah. I don't think the, the people, the listeners, uh, I really don't think they understand how vital that role is right. to these to the to the team. Right. Yeah, it, it, it's essential. And I think it's a role that has rightfully grown in importance over the last 10 years or so, even yeah. since we left the mm -hmm. league. Uh, it's a role that it's intended to separate the football side from the player side. So it's the players lives off the field. And, you know, what I think is great is a lot of teams, if not all, have the player engagement person's office next to the locker room or close to the locker room. It's not upstairs because yeah. for the longest time, it's a, hey, if you're going upstairs, it's, uh, yeah, it's like, where are you going? Who do you want to talk to? Maybe you're like, ah, you know what? There's something I want to talk about. It feels like the principal's office. Right. Yeah. So I think having a great relationship with your player engagement uh, person, individual, you know, whatever the role is, um, is essential because we're getting pulled in so many di different directions. You know, it, it, it's a very demanding profession that we have as professional athletes and life happens. There's a lot of things off the field, um, you know, that can be challenging. Other times it could be exciting and you need to have a resource there uh, because you're spending so much time at the facility. It, it's it's needed because you're not going to have time to go talk to your coach or sometimes mm -hmm. you might not see your spouse or your significant other for an extended period of time. You need to have somebody to vent sometimes, somebody to talk to, somebody to bounce ideas off of. So having that person at every team is uh, very valuable. Yeah, not only that, but um, actually him being like a, being able to um, express to you mm -hmm. some of the things that the coaches may be thinking as well. Right. And so it's able to be uh, not only uh, like mediator kind of yeah, sort of. Yeah, yeah. You yeah. know what I mean? So it's between. not only mm -hmm. being able to be heard, but also absorbed. Oh, uh, yeah. Because, you know, when you hear from the coach, sometimes you, if you don't vibe with the right. coach, it might not be received right. 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 Versus like you vibing with the player engagement guy. I, shout out to my man, uh, Fast Fred McAfee of the New <laughs> yeah. Orleans Saints. Yeah. Uh, he's my guy. He do, did so much for me yeah. as a player engagement person. Not only that, but he's also a teammate of mine. Yeah. When he retired, he That's became cool. That's the awesome. player engagement guy. And, Man, he's one of the top and one of the best did ever. He, did he ever really teach you how to be punctual? Uh, no, nah, that's that's just not my thing. Well, you know, with Coach Coffin, uh, all the clocks in the facility are set five minutes early. So, yeah, you know, yeah, you got. Trained. I wish you would have played. I wish you would have <laughs> played for Coughlin. I the the Giants tried to trade for me um, early in my I career. That was it. Was it the? I wish they would. I wish they would have got. <laughs> no, I, no, actually, what it was, they were they were gonna. Uh, it was gonna be a one on one trade. I don't know if anybody knows this, but here oh, we just break it out. News, the, right? Yeah, I guess put so. it out there. TMZ. So, um, so the Giants were going to wanted to trade for me, and they wanted uh, the Saints said, you know, well, you give us Jeremy Shockey, and the and then I'd have traded. <laughs> they were like, no, actually, the Giants wanted me. The Saints were like, all right, well, who do you want? And then they said they wanted me, and uh, they were like, all right, well, what's up? And then they said no. Um, the Saints said no. Yeah. Saints yeah. did not want to give me up That's for Shockey. So instead they gave up a second round pick. Yeah. I remember that. that. I was on the team. And yeah, yeah. And got that and got that back. And um uh, they 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 so uh I only knew that true. I thought it was just a rumor. Uh -huh. And then I met Dave Gettleman uh for yeah, the Carolina Dave. Panthers. Yep. And he yep. was like, Oh no, that I was, was in a real room. deal. Yeah. Yeah, he cause when I first signed there, he said Mr. G. Yeah. He was like, I've been wanting you since you were like year three. Yeah. I I wanted you all the way up here in New York. I was in the room. I said, I thought that was just a rumor. He's like, Oh no. Dave it Gettleman. Was real. Dave Gettleman is the first person I met when they claimed me off of waivers, and I pulled yeah. up to the old Giant Stadium, yeah. and he's right there, and he's like, "I've been watching you the whole time," so, you know, similar yeah. type of thing. And yeah. was, that was kind of uh, my first uh, experience, first person I met from the Giants' uh, office. But I do have a funny story. You talked about the Saints. I don't know about you, Peanut, but every time we went to the Superdome, it was bad it for was, you guys. At least, <laughs> at least five or six touchdown passes from Drew Brees, um, and I still have. Lying. You see how I'm like kind of looking off in the space. Yeah. It's like PTSD because I can still hear the music. You know the music after yeah, the yeah. touchdown. Yeah. You know the song, right? Yeah. Man, oh, man. Exactly. Man. And so the 2011 season. Uh, oh Super Bowl my 46, gosh, that was our be best team. So they beat us in a regular season that year. I think it was on Monday Night Football. 49 to 27. Yeah, it was bad. I think we scored late. You know, right. 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 So to make it look better. You're right. right? Uh, this is so irrational, but we had a divisional playoff game at the 15 and one Green Bay Packers okay. on a Sunday. Yeah. 
in the divisional round. Uh, the Saturday divisional game was New Orleans at San Francisco. Yep. And we get to our hotel and we're not even worried about the 15 and one <laughs> team that we're playing tomorrow. The defending Super Bowl champ, 15 yeah. and one team. We have our eyes on this San Francisco, New Orleans game, praying that San Francisco somehow wins. This is the one in San Francisco, right? Yeah. This is that we yeah, talked about. Game. Tony Monta. Yeah, yes. the Tony Montana yes. game. Crazy game yes. where there was like four touchdowns in the last yeah. two minutes. Of the yeah, it was crazy. And I mean, we're on the edge of our seats and, and we're watching and we're like, oh no. So if we go back to the Superdome, it's, oh, well. You know? <laughs> no, it, we talked about that. We, we said, yeah. literally, that was our best team. We won a Super Bowl in 09. Oh, yeah. But that 2011 team was electric. Uh, offensively, we put up all these points. Defensively, we were really good. Forcing turnovers. We got after people. And we knew, like, that was our chance. Like, we just, Atlanta just happened to be winning all right. these games. And, like, we, we just didn't get a home game. Uh, we had to go on the road, and we played so bad. We had, like, four or five turnovers, and we still barely lost the game. And we were like, man, we were kicking ourselves because. Then you see us. Yeah, because, right? yeah, because. That's typically what happens. Yeah. Whenever they see the Giants win, it was like, yeah, oh, the we Giants did. won? We were, well, not only that, but it was like, dude, we would have crushed the Giants. Like. <laughs> Like the Giants, Eli had zero success coming to Superdome. Superdome was an awful place. It, it was right. a bad, bad place for the Giants. Like, not a good place. It for was him. not a good place. Every time we matched up, it was he. I mean, yeah, I can still hear the music. I can still hear it. Still it's hear like it. so when we saw that because we didn't think you guys would win, and then when you guys went on, then you go into San Francisco <laughs> and beat San Francisco on top of it. We were oh, just that's like, funny. dude. There's no way they would have beat us in New Orleans. But, hey, you know, it's all Warner on the bridge, and congrats yeah. to you for your second Super Bowl. Yeah. Well, you're almost there, right? <laughs> <laughs> I'm, still, I'm still better than you. I'm still oh, better than you. Oh. Really? Did I have to that say that? That was the personal jab. That was, that back. was like you know that, was? that was like real that was personal. That was from the fraternity thing, I think, yeah. early on. Yeah. <laughs> anyway. So, here's a fun question for you. Yeah. Uh, it's a society question. What is the coil? What is cool and dagger society? Oh, I can't tell you that. What? You can't tell me that. Oh, that's oh a, no, I'm joking. I was, uh, no, say, no, I was no, like, no, oh, okay, no, that's some no, secret. Uh, it's an honor society. It is. It's a little tongue in cheek. It's like a, 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 you know, secret society. You know, okay. You, remember the movie The Skulls? Yeah, yeah. It's not like that. It's not like no. that. Okay. <laughs> no, this. Uh, it's an honor society that I'm uh, pleased to be a part of at Cornell. It, it dates back, you know, a very long time, and it's usually for students and eventually alums who've had a tremendous amount of success in the classroom as well as um, are considered leaders on campus. Yeah. So, um, yeah, but it's one of those things that we like to keep some secrecy around it. Okay. Because it looks... He tries to do that with his uh, Q, oh his, his Q cats, the Q cats. He be trying to... Oh, oh, uh, you you can dish it, but you can't take it. Anyway, the Q cats. So, uh... <laughs> I got another question for you. Is it yeah. true that when you're in college, you memorize the hometown of your opponents? Uh, no, I, I, you know what? I think I knew some, uh, but is not this really. A Cornell thing? No, it's not this a Cornell a, thing. Not a Cornell thing. <laughs> Kevin, no, no, no. <laughs> I think, I think they, they knew in college because, you know, I was a terror in college, you know, it feels good to say that. I don't know what it's like to be, you know, considered feared. Uh, <laughs> You know, a lot of times they so would know a lot never about get me, to right? You know what I mean? Yeah. It's, like, it's fun. <laughs> it's fun. Man, is this what it feels like to be, <laughs> you know? Uh, no, I tell you, man, I peaked in college. No, uh, no, I didn't know too much about them, but it was a lot of intense film study for sure. I hear that. Uh, you got the other one? Oh, yeah. No, you do the, the one we, we never ask anybody. Okay. Uh-oh. Right. You ready for it right now? I'm ready for it right now. Nervous. Are you nervous? A little bit. Don't be. All right. We've never asked anyone this question. Ever. Ever. Yeah, this is a new one. We've been talking about this for a while. I'm the guinea pig, then. Let's you are go. the guinea pig. All Crash right. test dummy. <laughs> All right, you ready? Three, two, one. Mount Rushmore. Four greats of all time. Who's on your Mount Rushmore list of people of influence that have influenced you, your life, your playing career? Wow. Um, wow is right. Okay. You like that? I like that. Because that can go... In a variety of places, right? Um, Take it how you want. Yep. This is a, it's my answer, right? It's your answer. My Mount Rushmore. Your Mount. So uh, first would be my brother. So I have one brother. He's 10 years older than me. And he played through college. And he wore 77 for the majority of his career. That was- He was an O-lineman as yep, well. Yeah, he was an O-lineman eventually. He actually uh, started out as a tight end in college and then Made kept his way growing up. and growing and growing. But, you know, 
that was probably the beginning of my love of football is watching him play in high school and then oh, wow. going to watch him play in college. And Where do you go to school? He went to East Carolina. So, oh, yeah. Yep. So he was there in the early 90s. So, you know, that's his a, freshman that's a year wild school too. Jeff Blake and Robert Jones. And then uh, Jeff you know, he, Blake. Yeah, there was, there was some good teams. There was some fun times watching him play. He played against some very good players, too. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, really starting to love the game of football then. So I'd mm-hmm. say he's one up there. Uh, second, because I started watching football right around then, uh, my earliest NFL memory is Super Bowl 23. And the reason why is because I grew up in South Florida and Super Bowl 23 was in Miami. And I remember watching the 49ers against the Bengals and watching Jerry Rice mm. win MVP. So Jerry Rice was my favorite player throughout my still is probably uh, just in terms of his work ethic and being able to see how successful he was on the field. And that was my welcome to football. Here it is. This team's awesome. San Francisco 49ers are my favorite team growing up. Mine uh, too. I was devastated. The 19, you talk about irony, uh, watching the Giants beat them in the NFC championship game a couple of years later. And not were, getting yeah. Joe Montana knocked out. That whole deal. You know, the first tragic. time I met, the first time I met Leonard Marshall, I'm like, man, <laughs> The pain, the pain, you know? Uh, so Jerry Rice is up there. Uh, and I used to think I'd be a wide receiver. And then that went away probably by the time I was 10 years old. I realized kept that growing. if I kept playing football, uh, it's going to be hand in the dirt. Uh, <laughs> um, next, after that, to influence my career, um, I would say Coach Coughlin. Um, just because of how he helped mold uh, my teammates, young men into, uh, you know, great people, great football players, great fathers. You know, I think just the the morals that he always had. And at the time, it felt cheesy at times because he was a big quote guy. He'd bring up the the war quotes and, you know, yeah. he'd have all these different sayings and he'd kind of leave it with you. But to this day, I still think about him and, you know, it still applies. So yeah. um, and he's somebody who I still talk to regularly. And then. Um, wow. Wow. For the last one, that's probably the toughest one. Uh, Mount Rushmore, I would say uh, the best offensive lineman I played with, and he's still one of my very good friends, is Chris Knee with the Giants. And he was somebody yeah. that I watched my rookie year. I'm like, who is this guy? Man, this is how you're supposed to play guard in the NFL. And then coming over to the team and him, Sean O'Hara, Kareem McKenzie, Dave Deal, Rich Soybert, how they welcomed me, you know, because it was like that new kid in school that just joined. I, I came to the team week one. So, uh, you know, being able to learn under him and then being able to uh, try to pattern as much of my game after him and somebody who I thought for a three, four year stretch was the best guard in the NFL. Mm-hmm. So I think when I t- talk about Mount Rushmore of who I am as a football player and then Beyond that, I would say those four. So you kind of have a, a mix there. You know, you yeah. have my childhood, my uh, contemporary, a family member, and then uh, a leader, uh, you know, a coach. So I think that's Dang. my four. I like it. That's a good mountain. Yeah, man. It's a great mountain, Rushmore. Yeah. Great job. Thanks. So, Thanks. Not anyway. bad for the first one, right? Set the bar high? Set the bar very high. <laughs> Set the bar very high. <laughs> you laughing. Why are you laughing? Because we ask everybody that. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> man. He couldn't even. He could, I wasn't even going to say nothing. You were going to let him live it. I was going to let him live it. Let me go. I was going to let him live it. You just popped a bubble, man. Right you there. Just, right there. You could have let it go. You could have said it <laughs> later. <laughs> you know? Tom is back there laughing. <laughs> I was going to let him make it. Jay's I was wondering if you start to squirm Taylor a little bit. Taylor laughing. You know, I, I can feel, you know, you can feel when people are laughing behind you, but you don't want to turn around. They literally are laughing behind you right now. I can sense it. If you look behind you, they are legit laughing. I can sense it. I was going to let you make it. <laughs> but oh, your man. tears, your nah. tears. Yeah. I was nah. like, don't you cry it up. We got to tell him. I was yeah. like, man, that was a deep, uh, that was a deep answer. It really that was a deep answer. Strong, I got Rome yeah. here crying. Yeah, Rome's probably thinking about, you know, who are his safety buddies who he played with, yeah. who are his battery mates back right there. Oh, oh, man. <laughs> oh, no. Hey, can we appreciate you coming on hey, the show, absolutely. man? Absolutely. This was a this blast. Was, this was fun. We appreciate yeah. you. Love what you're doing for the league and the player, uh, player engagement crew, man. Keep doing your thing. Yeah. Thank you for blessing us with your presence. And uh, I just want to say uh, one more thing. Yep. How does it feel to continue to now you have a different role, but you yep. continue to impact the game itself? Do you take pride in that individual? I do. Uh, I always wanted to stay involved with the game of sports. I mean, with the game of football, I wanted to stay involved in sports originally. And then uh, making that transition, figuring out what that next step would be yeah. and realizing that, you know, I had an opportunity to join the league office um, was something that 
kept me close enough to the game, but then also be able to impact the game in other ways without feeling sore on a day-to-day basis. So, uh, no, it, it's great to, to continue to serve the game of football. Right. That's going to be here, you know, long after we're gone. So try to leave it better than you found it, and uh, that's my goal. And you know what? And that's a great way to end because I feel like that's what Peanut and I are trying to do. Right. Being able to interview more and more of you guys that continue to impact the game. And, uh, and we are all stewards of this great game in the NFL yeah. and how much is done for us. I really feel like we're just trying to serve it in the best way possible. And that's why you're here today. And I appreciate that last answer because it's a great way to end it, man. So appreciate yeah. it, man. Good job. Um, thank you, man. All of our viewers and, and followers out there continue to uh, wherever you pick up your 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 podcast app. Man, you got me messed up today, Peanut. Maybe because I'm late. All right. Well, anyways, wherever you get your listen to your podcast, that was Apple Podcasts, iHeartRadio Podcast. Continue to listen. Give us a view. Tell a friend to tell a friend to tell a friend. Give us a five star rating. Hit that follow button. Man, this is a good one again. We're going to continue to load them up. We have more and more people in their second acts doing great things, not only for themselves personally, but for the NFL. Pushing it forward, man. Kevin Booth, you are one of those people. We appreciate you. I'm Cheers. Peanut. That's Roman. That's Kevin. Hey, man, this is the NFL Player Second Acts Podcast. Thank y'all for tuning in. Great Ru- Mount Rushmore, too. We Thanks. out. <laughs> Peace.